the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Okay, and Mr. Slade's absence, absence this morning, our duly elected chairman, uh, I'm going to be serving as chairman for this meeting as vice chair. So uh, our first order of business is to uh, review and approve the minutes and decision letters from our previous month's meeting. Uh, does anyone have any edits or recommendations for the minutes? Ms. Adams. Yes, um, I, I have an edit to last month's minutes as it relates to the first case. Um, I don't think I was included on the vote there and I voted in favor of the motion. So I make a motion to make that, that edit. We got a motion to uh, amend the minutes uh, to add Ms. Ronette Adams' vote. Is there a second? A second. All right, motion been made and properly seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Like sign, okay. All right, does anybody have any other edits to the minutes they would like to, to add? I, I think we've got one other change that, uh, and it wouldn't hurt to check other people's memories on this, but yeah. I, I remember Mr. Slade voting uh, um, on, in opposition on that first case. Is that consistent with everybody else's memory? Yes. Okay. All right. So would someone like to make a motion to make that uh, change? I'll make a motion to amend the minutes to show that Mr. Slade severe voted against uh, the case. Okay, we have a motion to amend the minutes to show Mr. Slade's uh, correct vote. Is there a second? No, second. All right, motion's been made, properly seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, motion passes. Okay, so anybody notice anything else in the minutes? Or, uh, or decision letters that they would like to address at this time. I just noticed a couple spelling okay. errors. Okay. Um, section two, uh, down at the bottom where it says Miss Kimberly Hayes, um, there's two typos. It should say floodway and flood zone buffer instead of flow. Okay. And the word disturb should say distributed. Okay. While we're on the topic of, uh, of uh, spelling and uh, terminology, does anybody have any others that they might want to roll into that proposal so we can kind of cover them all in one motion? Okay, seeing none, uh, we have a, a motion. I assume that was a motion. That was a motion. <laughs> that was a motion to, uh, to make those uh, uh, editorial changes to the minutes. Uh, second. Motion's been made, properly seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, motion carries. Okay, anybody like to uh, <laughs> propose a motion on the uh, thoroughly amended minutes and, uh, and decision letters? You want to handle those one motion at a time or together? I move we accept the amended minutes and the decision letters. All right, we have a motion made to accept the amended minutes and the decision letters. Is there a second? Second. All right, motion's been made and properly second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those say aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. All right, motion carries. Okay, we'll have our first case come on up to the front. Uh, after we have some uh, introductory comments from Stormwater staff uh, to describe the case, uh, we'll ask for your comments and we'll ask you to press the uh, mic button each time you speak and to turn it off each time you're, you're finished so that we can record your comments for the record and for public television broadcast uh, of the hearing. So, 
Vice Chair, I need to recuse myself. Okay, we have one member that needs to recuse themselves. Anybody else have a need? Okay, I, I, along that same line, I need to state that I know the gentleman sitting to the right, he was my graduate student in graduate school, so just to make that a, a formal, open, transparent uh, thing, uh, but I don't think I'm biased about him enough to, to, <laughs> to recuse myself, so, because I did give him grades, that's right, so I <laughs> certainly wasn't biased in giving him grades, so. Uh, uh, okay, so we're ready to describe the case, thank you. And if you okay. introduce yourself to, uh, for, the, for the record. Yes, my name is Courtney Larson, Metro Water Services, Development Services. The case number is 2017-00025. The name is Vintage at Century Farms at 5430 Cane Ridge Road. Uh, parcel number 174-000-06100. The inspector is Sean Herman and it's Council District 32 with uh, <coughs> The applicant's request is to allow the following. Number one, a permanent zone one buffer disturbance. And number two, a stream encapsulation of approximately 40 linear feet. The appellant is Old Acre McDonnell. The representative is Mr. Jason Deal. Uh, the comments, stormwater staff are as following. If the variance is approved, staff requests that the applicant provides treatment for the dog park in addition to the mitigation shown. Codes, no pr comment was provided. Planning, variance request is excuse me, consistent with the SP site plan. And Greenways defers to stormwater staff comments. All right, at this time we'd like to hear from the applicant. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. My name is uh, Jason Deal. I'm with uh, Barge Wagner. Uh, and what, what we're proposing is basically, uh, it's about a 217 unit apartment complex. Um, and then we were doing our layout. Um, kind of this this site is multiple parcels um, that we're combining. It's part of the uh, uh, an overall, I guess, Century Farm development that's uh, being uh, developed right now. Uh, and it's kind of the the property is kind of uh, long uh, along Cane Ridge Road, but uh, kind of narrow in width. Um, and kind of at the center of this property is, you can kind of see this little uh, uh, stream that uh, juts out, well, to the west, I'm sorry, uh, that juts out from the main tributary. Um, and it basically is coming out of, uh, it's coming out of, a, a, I guess, a, a cave feature. Um, there's the pictures of, of, of where this uh, stream is coming out. Um, originally, uh, we had proposed uh, uh, placing a uh, bioretention area above this stream feature um, because of the uh, elevation differences or uh, we're probably 20 feet above, uh, our finished grades are probably about 20 feet above where this stream comes out. Um, so our original intent was to, to basically just straddle the bioretention pond above the stream. Staff kind of thought this was not an, uh, 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 a good approach. Um, so we came back and looked at uh, trying to box around the stream in its entirety um, and, and shifting the bioretention pond. Um, and, and looking at that, it basically cut the property in half as far as an access. Um, and codes is requesting a second access to this property. Um, it, there's another plan that shows our primary access is kind of to the north. And then they're wanting a secondary access uh, there at the southern corner. Um, so, it, it, oh yeah, uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, so, in order to facilitate that comment from codes and uh, to kind of keep the building layout functional the way the way uh, we originally proposed and to keep uh, the total number of units kind of uh, keep the project viable from that standpoint um, we, we are looking at putting the parking um, over this stream feature uh, and then we shifted the uh, bioretention pond um, to the south uh, a little bit, outside the buffer area of that little stream. And then we are actually creating a second bioretention pond to the north 
uh, it's, it's on the other sheet, I apologize, but uh, there's a second pond uh, up in the northeast corner there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, to, to facilitate the storm drainage. Um, so uh, that's kind of the approach that we've taken now. Uh, and in order to do that, we are gonna have to, to encapsulate about, it's about 36 feet of stream. Um, we have gone through and gotten TDEX uh, approval for an ARAP for that encapsulation. Um, we are proposing to do uh, basically an open bottom um, culvert. So, and we'll be uh, basically spanning the banks so we don't uh, anticipate having to have any kind of core uh, permit. Um, so, uh, as I said, we've, we've gotten our ARAP permit in place. We've gotten our, uh, basically our uh, notice of coverage in place from uh, TDAC. Uh, and we're now coming to you guys to uh, ask for y'all's uh, permission to, to uh, put this uh, roadway and parking over this stream. Oh, sorry. Uh, just to add to that, a um, little bit about the mitigation plan. Uh, there's some buffer enhancements that are uh, proposed and those equate to about a three to one ratio for what we would be impacting. Um, we've talked to staff and, um, you know, we have looked at uh, some of the dog park stuff too and there is going to be a program implemented on this project uh, where they're going to DNA test the residents' animals. And if, if waste is found on the property or left on the property, then they will actually send it off for testing uh, and then they will get the results back and fines will be administered for uh, any waste that's encountered on the property. Uh, this is a, a program that they implement on all their properties and it, they claim that it's about a 95% reduction in, um, in fecal matter and uh, any harm that could potentially happen to the adjacent streams. So but we, we work really hard with staff and redesigning this to try to avoid and minimize as much as possible uh, and still make this project a, a viable project. Um, and that's why we're here today to ask for your uh, support in our proposal. Okay, is that your complete presentation, gentlemen? Yes. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Um, at this time, we'll hear from uh, members of the public who may want to speak uh, uh, in support of the proposal. So is anybody here who wants to come up to the microphone and speak in support of the proposal? All right, seeing none, uh, we also offer an opportunity for those who would like to speak in opposition to the proposal. Is anybody present who would like to come to the mic and speak in opposition to the proposal? All right, seeing none, then we'll uh, see if we have any written uh, comments that have been submitted in, in those regards. I received an email on yesterday, and it is in with your package. It's from Mill Creek Watershed Association. And it states, the village at Century Farms develop, development at 5438 Cane Ridge Road proposes a parking area over a natural spring and stream. The natural spring is the source for stream two, a tributary to Collins Creek, which feeds into Mill Creek. The natural spring is located inside a cave in the proposed plan, an open bottom culvert begins at the cave entrance, straddles the stream bed, and daylights the stream at the edge of the parking area. The MCWA acknowledged the development team's effort to perform due diligence and reduce environmental impacts. The due diligence efforts include hiring an environmental consultant to observe the site's existing conditions and to evaluate potential environmental impacts of the development. The environmental, environmental consultants report concluded that the environmental impacts would be minimal and the impacts on the stream to be insignificant. The reduction of the env environmental impact includes an open bottom culvert, does help to protect the stream. While these efforts are appreciated, the MCWA strongly advocates for an alternative strategy 
that avoids impacting the stream. The development can occur while also protecting the spring and stream. The stream and spring can be entities to the proposed development features that are unique to the site. The MCWA report, excuse me, requests the development team review the proposed development to preserve stream two, its headwater spring source, and maintain the associated buffers required by Metro Water. Okay, I think those are all the comments that have been submitted uh, for the record for this particular proposal. So at this time, we'll uh, open it up for members of the Stormwater Committee to ask questions and uh, clarify some points. So, Mr. Chair, I just have some questions. Could you show me on the plans where the stream, the culvert's going to be, what part? I saw it where the stream was, but not where it is underneath the concrete or whatever. Yes, ma'am. It's right in that general area right there. Uh, so it extends basically into the middle of the drive um, for a reference point. Um, Thank you. And maybe I missed this, but were you all comfortable with staff's um, recommendation to do the treat the, the dog park, if, am I correct that yes. you were with? And you, you mentioned something about um, charging um, the residents of the area. How? How would that work? Because if, you know, how will you determine who would be responsible for the, the is that an overall um, expense that will you give to anyone that has a, a, a pet? So I don't know how that would be maintained. I've got some additional information here, but there's a program, it's called Poo Prints. And uh, what it, basically what they require their residents to do is they have to fill out a contract at when they, if they have an animal on the property. And in that contract, they have to have uh, some DNA tests done on their animal. And then whenever something is found, the DNA is then sent to the laboratory, and then it's determined whose animal it is, and then therefore they're issued a fine. So. Okay, I got a couple of questions. Uh, one of the things we try to do is we try to characterize what's uh, unique about um, the features of your request for a variance and, and what's normal. And that kind of helps us sort out um, um, our perspective about what's at stake in terms of, uh, of uh, the, the intent and spirit of the stormwater regulations. So it, it, it appears that the stream encapsulation and the zone one buffer, the biggest zone one buffer disturbance is a is a side sort of tributary of this main stream. Yes, that's okay. correct. Okay. And, uh, um, but it's also a spring water source for the stream. So do you have any measurements about the flow that the spring is contributing uh, to this portion of the creek? What percentage of flow? Uh, it would be a very small percentage of the flow that's going to this this overall tributary to Collins Creek. The we don't actually have a flow rate for for this tributary. Um, it it was deemed that it is not exceptional Tennessee waters by TDEC already. That was one of the first things that our environmental consultants did was try to figure out the the quality of the watershed and what what the potential impacts may be as we were going through this process and, and working with TDEC on the ARAP. Um, but, I mean, I would venture to say that this would be a, a less than 5%, you know, of the watershed that's, that's drained towards this creek. Okay. okay. Yeah. And uh, um, I guess further along in that regard, um, uh, you mentioned TDEC. Have you gotten any feedback from the Corps of Engineers about this? Uh, the Corps of Engineers permit is not required okay. uh, per the environmental consultants because we are not impacting the bed and the bank. Okay. Uh, so we're avoiding that. Okay. So there's no fill, in other words. Right. Okay. right. All right. And um, in terms of any other zone one disturbance, there's there's none other than this particular that, that's section, correct. except that's correct. for the zone two disturbance. That, that is correct. Okay. Along the along the 
the, the mainstream that this tributary feeds. That's correct. Okay. So, you know, just for the benefit of the Stormwater Committee members, if everybody didn't understand that the same way I, uh, it was just described, it, it sounds like we have a stream encapsulation of a spring source tributary of a creek and a zone one disturbance of a spring source tributary of a creek. Um, So what are, what is everybody's uh, initial reaction? I more questions. Originally you said that the, the spring was 20 feet lower than the parking lot, but yet it's underneath the parking lot. So I'm not. I yes, but, well, what I was trying to say was uh, originally we had, uh, ba basically if you can imagine, um, this, this property fronts Cane Ridge Road and Cane Ridge is sitting up here and and we're setting the apartment complex here and the natural grade is down here. So that's what I was meaning by the spring, when it, when it outlets, it's literally 20 feet below where our parking level would be. But just because of the way we're having to get access to Cane Ridge and how we're siting the buildings on the property. Uh, th did that answer your question? So when you talk about encapsulating that, really it is gonna be quite a large well, the yeah, difference yeah, from yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. From yeah. the bottom of the parking lot to the stream. Yes, ma'am. And we'll we'll be. I mean, we're not. Uh, I guess another thing to point out is, I mean, we'll we'll be um, managing the stormwater from the apartment complex. Um, it won't be dumping into that spring. It's going to be going through um, the required bioretention areas. It'll be draining into a detention system and then exiting into the tributary uh, to the, I think it's Collins Creek tributary. So it's not like, I, I, I don't want you to visualize that we've got rainwater that's going to be shedding over into this spring. I'm, I don't know if that was the concern, but uh, that that's, uh, uh, I, it's just basically the, the 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 natural grade out there falls off uh, pretty quickly from Cane Ridge Road. Uh, just to add to that, maybe to provide a little bit of clarity, if you, if you saw the one picture where um, you, you saw the karst topography and the, and the water come out, essentially what we're doing with the culvert is we're trying to mimic that same structure and just just pull it out a little bit further and and keep the natural bed and bank of that facility and just tie it right back in. Okay, is there any staff comments that, uh, any perspective you all can share on this? Um, it's a pretty unusual case. Um, um, I guess, do you have a specific question or? <laughs> it is unusual, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, sometimes we get a little more feedback than if the variance is approved. We think you should do this. Uh, do you all have a feeling about, um, you know, the impacts to the resource? You know, it, 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 and, and, and let me see if I can help you a, a little bit uh, in response to your appropriate request for me to do that. Um, it, it sounds like the buffer is the biggest loss of this particular proposed individual site change. Uh, it sounds like they're trying to, to maintain the integrity of the spring uh, structural features so that water can flow in an, in an encapsulated conveyance. Uh, but basically in an undisturbed way, but we still have a zone one buffer disturbance of a headwater stream. And you know, I happen to know a little bit about headwater streams, they're pretty special, even when they're short and small like this. Um, so what do you all think about the issue of, of uh, removing a buffer from this type of headwater spring source? And, and the structural influences that they're proposing. Um, as a regulator, we can never support the removal of a buffer from a headwater stream. So, 
Um, as far as an opinion on, on that they tried to um, mitigate their disturbance, I, I believe they worked with staff to do that, but this also appears like a, a case where um, the hardship is that they want parking in a drive aisle and additional apartments on their property. Don, oh, yes, ma'am. Can you share some of your wealth of knowledge of a <laughs> water as stream? As long as legal counsel think that's appropriate. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's... It is. Uh, as, as long as, as if there's an expert witness speaking, you don't want to substitute your testimony for that of an expert witness. But, I, I mean, you all were chosen in part because you have existing mm -hmm. relevant knowledge. You just have to... Um, you know, not think of him as a testifying witness. Right. I have a question or two, maybe. Yeah, Mr. Dale, that'll get me off the hook temporarily. Yeah, I'm, I'll try to let you <laughs> Exactly. I'll, I'll go back to more of the engineering design aspect, maybe. So uh, how wide is this? Is it an arch? I'm having a hard time reading this. Is there, It's an arch you're playing? And what is the width of that arch? Yeah, it's going to be about, uh, I think it's about 30 feet is basically okay. the width. And, and so the, re the reason it's, it, mm -hmm. that stream kind of meanders, mm -hmm. and we're just trying to capture that man just a straight shot basically okay. and so um what is the difference in elevation from the top of that arch uh, you have fill on top of that and so how much fill do you have on top of that arch uh there'll probably be upwards of 12 to 15 foot of fill okay. on top of that because i know she had looked like storm drainage going right. over the top of it um so how many units are these apartments there's 217 units how much parking do you have do you have an idea it's right it's like 300 and uh, it's 325, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's basically to the minimum parking requirement. So did you, did you look at maybe, uh, I know it would be probably a little unusual, but maybe eliminating some spaces there and doing like just a turn down retaining wall or something and not having to encapsulate all of that? We have looked at that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then what, what, what was your thoughts about that after you it, it that. just it just appeared to us that we would be uh, the amount of disturbance we'd be doing to do that mm -hmm. would the offset the, the wall maybe in the right, uh, right. Uh, and uh, you know there there is a, a little bit factor of safety there that um, you know you're gonna have a basically a 15 foot drop going all around this area so to us it just it just naturally made a little more sense just to to, to put that drop in one spot um, and I mean from our original from our original plans we're we're, we're basically having that amount of, uh, of encapsulation so um. okay thank you how how do you transition from the culvert to the cave because the cave looked like it was triangular yeah, well, we'll have to go in and uh, uh, basically we're preserving the bottom. So we, we'll be putting in uh, pro it'll, uh, the arch system. We'll have to go back and excavate the top. So the, the, the cave itself will be, I mean, we'll be cutting back into that cave top, I guess, and putting in our arch system. So the, the, the arch system won't necessarily be spanning over the cave, if that's the question. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to visualize. Sure, I understand. Yeah. Larger arch okay. coming out from it, so it'd be a smaller opening coming out into a larger Opening. I've got a representative picture if you'd like to see it. I mean, kind of, uh, this is as close as I could find that, that would kind of show you what, what, what this would kind of ultimately look like. So that, that bottom would stay undisturbed, but the top, you'd have to fit that arch in. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, are we missing anything as far as um, 
when they uh, did any kind of studies or environmental studies of this, is there something that we're missing that's helping us make a decision? And I know you, someone asked about the, the amount of uh, flow out of this, or, uh-huh. Yeah, I, I, you know, the... Or what other characteristics, I'm, an, I'm not an environmentalist, you obviously have the greatest amount of expertise on this. Well, uh, data is the best expertise. Right. And, uh, and so, I mean, are we, are we missing something in order to render a decision? That, that's my question to you. Is there something that we would need that would help us maybe determine the quality, you know, or, of this uh, resource? Because, yeah. I mean, I think they've done a good job as far as their design is concerned. I just don't know. You know, I, I think that expanding this, I mean, makes sense. But is there any kind of detrimental effect to, to spanning that? And what is the quality of what we're spanning? And, and, and tying into it, are we doing any kind of damage? Or it's, 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 it's a new territory for me, I guess. And you probably have the best expertise on this. And so uh, I just want to make sure that if, if I were to make a motion on this, that it's, it's properly uh, based upon having all the information that I would need to have. So am I missing something? That's my question. I have a similar question, um, Roy. Is mm -hmm. Having 36 feet of the stream covered where it's not receiving light, or does that impact the quality of the water, or does it improve the, uh, either negatively or positively? Uh, That's exactly what I'm trying to say. So what is the quality of what's there? And if we encapsulate it or span it, what is the detrimental effect? Is it something that we can quantify? Um, I have no ability to do that. I, you know, the one one could say that the bigger issue here is that um, um, you know they wouldn't be mitigating it if there weren't things that were being lost that they're trying to replace, and then secondly, they wouldn't be here if it weren't a protected resource. You know, if it were legal and it were okay to encapsulate streams, we wouldn't have variances for that. Uh, you know, uh, typically an encapsulated stream is groundwater, uh, encapsulated underground. Streams, uh, surface water hydrology exposed to sunlight, uh, you know, grows algae, which is the primary producers of the ecosystem that feed the rest of the food chain. So without sunlight, there's no algae in the stream. Um, this is a short segment. It's a, it's a spring source. So typically, these sites tend to be um, significant contributors of flow. But, they, but because they're, uh, they're headwater in nature, and, and because this one appears to be low flow, uh, it also has uh, some uh, capacity to remove nutrients to function a bit like a wetland. Uh, that's that's. There's lots of science on headwater streams, low flow, low velocity headwater streams behaving like wetlands, removing nitrogen and phosphorus much more efficiently than streams that move faster. So there's there's several issues with this. I'm not as concerned with those issues as as I am the hardship. You know you know based upon. What we heard in last month's meeting uh, about uh, clarifying hardship, um, you know, it's 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 not technically a hardship that um, this site uh, would have to be avoided in order to have um, a little more convenient parking and a little more convenient access and and frankly even a higher density of apartments. That's uh, this site is is not any more constrained than any other site site in the county that has waters and streams and springs on it. Um, that's why they're regulated. They're regulated to be protected. So, um, uh, so I I, uh, I don't really see much of an option but avoiding the spring, frankly. I, 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 I do, I am very encouraged and impressed by the effort they went through to try to mitigate it and to try to uh, preserve it. But uh, I, I'm not sure the regulations give us the ability to grant a variance on something that is uh, 
is more for the benefit of convenience and optimizing the development of the site and not for protecting the resource. So. So that's kind of uh, the spot we find ourselves in right now. So. So would, um, the applicant, would you be able to get more information about the impact on the stream and it's the quality of the water once it's covered and? Uh, I'm sure we can. Yes. Yes, we can provide that information. Okay. I guess in some ways that would help me. I mean, I agree with God that the hardship doesn't exist in, in, the, in the case that it is, you can take away units, you can take away parking spaces and maintain that stream. But if there's no detrimental impact to the stream by what you're doing, and you can show that and provide us accurate data, I mean, Dodd did say data is important, so and we don't have that. Okay. Yeah, we can provide that. Okay. So in this case, uh, uh, you all can uh, uh, I guess in order to protect your application, it, it, it would probably be, be better if we had a motion to defer in this case. Um, I want to point out something else. I mean, you made a very eloquent um, statement, and I'm not sure that, you know, providing that information is going to actually solve the issue. And, um, I'm sort of thinking that maybe there is a, another design that might work. Um, like where the building three is, if the parking was shifted to, to where that building is and then the building was put on the other side, it may be a smaller building, but there might be the ability to actually work around this uh, buffer. That's what you can And so, I, I mean, I think that they could do both. You know, they could look at both. Um, but I think that they'd also probably look, need to look at the, the redesign as well. So I, I would recommend uh, that they defer, that we defer this. I don't know if deferring at one meeting gives them adequate time or not. Uh, can we ask the applicant that? So, is that, is so that? yeah, why don't we do this? Why don't we poll the members to see how many people agree with Roy's okay. last statement that they really ought to redesign as opposed to just come up with more data to encapsulate it? Well, I think, I believe that that would be the ideal solution. Yeah, I don't want to throw the option. I mean, I think they have an option probably to do both, but I think just me watching fellow uh, chairmen, uh, fellow members here, I get a sense that I don't want to come, send them off on a mission to come back with this information and then it not be enough. Exactly. I, I think it's going to require a, a, a maybe, maybe it's a combination of both. Maybe it's a little redesign. And, and providing some more information as well. But uh, that's just the sense that I get. I'm just trying to save you guys time because I think that that's, that's the reality of, 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 of the senses that I feel around me. And, and, I, I, uh, and I'll mention too that I, you know, I, I do remember other cases in the past where uh, we have avoided encapsulating streams and there have been uses of retaining walls, there have been uses of wider um, preserved portions of the stream buffer so that uh, more of the buffer, particularly the zone one, could be preserved and sunlight could hit the stream. Um, uh, the Walmart uh, site down in, uh, off Old Hickory Boulevard is a good example of that. So uh, that was approved by this committee and by staff uh, many years ago. So uh, I, I just want to make sure you're leaving with clear direction so you don't waste your time. It's billable time, but your client <laughs> your client may appreciate a little more direction from the board. So it sounds like a, a focus on redesign and, and some data to support uh, any impact on this, this resource would help your case. Okay. So we have a motion. Our motion was to defer, but I don't know how... how so, Mr. Dale has made a motion to defer. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. Defer till how long? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. The, the rules of the committee do say that you can defer decisions for no longer than 30 days. Okay. Well, then we'll, I, I would, I would um, make a motion that we defer this to the next meeting. And if the applicant is not prepared, then I think he could probably work with staff and I assume that he could voluntarily ask this to be uh, extended. 
So you accept that? I accept that okay, uh, so motion amendment. Been, motion been made and properly seconded. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Aye. Right, one day motion passes yeah. with Thank one you. vote against any abstentions right. you're okay. next case thank you <coughs> Okay, we'll go through the same routine. Uh, will the next uh, applicants come forward to the table? Uh, staff will read uh, the details of your proposal, and then we'll ask for your testimony, Mr. Gangwer, and then we'll solicit input from uh, those in support or opposition and on the record, and then we'll have a discussion. All right, hello, committee members. Steve Mishu, Metro Water Development Services. Item number two is 2017 Stabage Suites Hotel. It's at 2540 Perimeter Place Drive and it's parcel number 95, map 109. Um, council District is uh, Councilman Syracuse. The applicant's request, he was granted a uh, preliminary approval on July 6, 2017. A request for uh, today is the following. Floodway buffer disturb uh, disturbance and encroachment. Uh, continuous mowing and maintenance of the buffer and uh, providing BMPs in the buffer. The uh, appellant is Heidi Eideline, being represented by Kevin Gangler, Civil Site Design. Uh, stormwater staff did not have any comments um, as we had comments on the preliminary and most of them were addressed. Coast provided no comments. Uh, planning, the site is zoned CS. The planning will defer the appeal decision to the Stormwater Management Committee and uh, Greenway also defers to Metro staff. Thank you. Mr. Gangwer, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kevin Gangwer, Civil Site Design Group, representing uh, the owner in this project. Um, I wanted to, um, what I've handed out to you, which I'll uh, come back to in just a second, is uh, a reminder. We were here uh, in June. Uh, with a preliminary and so I wanted to show you what we had back in June and, and then a copy of what we're proposing today just so to help refresh your memory. Um, so the, the lay of the land uh, to start with is, so this property is about five and a half acres um, in the Century City uh, development. Uh, it abuts an existing ornamental pond. Um, and the pond has a walkway and mowed area around the outside of it, um, which is most of the buffer area that we're disturbing is uh, the mode portion of this pond. The pond was built back in the early 80s. Uh, it's an ornamental pond. It doesn't have any detention capabilities, um, but it is used quite a bit by the, the community for walking and just enjoyment. Um, so that's what's there today. Um, Back in June, we came in front of you with uh, a plan, and it's the first, uh, the, sorry, the second sheet uh, of what I've handed out to you with a blue floodway line uh, highlighted, and then a green zone one and a pink zone two. That is the plan that we uh, brought to you and got your thoughts and inputs on that. Um, that plan shows uh, in both zone one and zone two, we have uh, paved uh, plaza areas, we have stormwater detention water quality, a basketball court, a swimming pool, a fire pit, um, part of the building, uh, and some parking. So we pretty much tried to put everything in the buffer that we possibly could uh, on that, it seems like. Um, and so, uh, and we're in the zone one with virtually all of our detention water quality um, and the zone two with most of those other things. So uh, at that meeting, the committee gave us some ideas and some thoughts. In, in, in a nutshell, they felt like, or you felt like, uh, we were just putting too much on this property. Um, just really trying to get too much building, too much parking, too much everything, and we're using the buffer to make up the difference uh, and that we should go back and try to uh, reduce what we're asking uh, on for this property. Um, 
you did give us some good information. You, you were um, sympathetic to this project and to this development based on the narrowness of the site, the steepness of the topography. Um, you seem to be willing to uh, to be lenient on uh, placing items in the zone two. Uh, preferred not to really have any permanent um, uh, impervious areas uh, at all in the zone one. Maybe would even be willing to allow some disturbance of the zone one. Um, so that's that was the takeaway uh, from that meeting. So uh, we fast forward to October and we come back with the plan that's the first sheet uh, of, of what I handed out to you. And what we've done um, is reduce the building. Uh, we were at 12,700 square feet of retail space. We're down to 5,500 square feet, so we've reduced it by 7,200 square feet. Um, we've moved the building and relocated the retail uh, further to the south and the east away from the pond back into the fat part of the site. Uh, and in doing that, we're able to move all of the pool, the parking, I mean, sorry, the pool, the plazas, the building, the basketball court, everything is out of the zone two, um, uh, except for the same parking that we had down at the northern end of the site, which is a one strip of parking and a, a piece of driveway. That part still remains in the zone two. Um, we were able to pull all of the, uh, virtually all of the detention water quality out of the zone one. Uh, there's one very small triangular piece of the bioretention that tweaks over into the zone two. And if you look on the screen uh, above behind uh, Dodd, it's this little small area right here. The yellow is the zone one buffer. And it's this very small area right here that crosses over the zone one. Uh, other than that, there's nothing in the zone one uh, area at all uh, permanent, um, just some grading, uh, revisions of the grading. So, um, and storm pipe and some things like that, but uh, no parking, no plazas, no any of that. So, so we felt like we've done quite a bit to uh, heed your advice and redesign the site and reduce uh, the site. Um, but we are still here, obviously, asking for a variance for disturbance of the buffer to place uh, permanent water quality in the buffer and, um, of course, continue to mow uh, along where the path is. We did create a mitigation plan that should be in your packet. Um, the mitigation plan, I think, is important uh, to, to kind of just touch on, uh, if we could. And it's, yeah, so it's up on the screen now. So what we're doing mitigation uh, for this, in addition to meeting the 80% uh, requirements for this project, which is just a standard requirement, the mitigation that we're offering is to um, exceed that treatment requirement. Um, so we will exceed the treatment requirement in a couple of ways. One, uh, the yellow area that's shown on the mitigation will be pervious pavers. So while it could be concrete or asphalt in order to, uh, and, and go to the bioretention and be treated and meet the requirement, um, we, we will be improving our numbers with having pervious pavement in, uh, in those areas. In addition, we're planning a uh, pretty long, well, for the full length of the property, uh, canopy and understory trees. Uh, we're putting those on our property line. It's a significant number of, of trees. Um, the staff has asked us, and the owner is uh, going to, willing to, and going to ask the neighbor, uh, who is a, an association of the building owners of Century City, could we plant some of those trees along the banks of the pond as opposed to along the property line. So uh, the owner is willing and will do that. That's a perfect picture right there um, where you can see this walking trail and this pretty wide strip of grass. And we're very willing to plant trees along that bank of that pond um, to help, I guess, the, the ecology of the pond 
So, um, but that will be up to the owner of that property if, if they'll let us do that or not. And then uh, probably the last and relatively significant um, mitigation is in the blue box, uh, we show a 50% water quality unit uh, to the to the east of our property is an apartment development, a, a, a industrial style uh, office building, um, and and then some wooded area. It's about four and a half acres, and of that four and a half acres, probably at least three and a half of it uh, is developed uh, with buildings and pavement. All of that just drains directly down to the Ornamental Pond and to the Sims Branch Creek. Um, currently, we will, of course, collect that water. We need to to, uh, to route it through our property, but we'll route that through a 50% unit uh, as well before releasing it. So now we're catching three and a half acres of developed land, or four and a half acres, three and a half being the developed portion, uh, and getting it treated, which is currently not being treated. So all of that is, uh, is what we put in front of you today and request um, uh, your approval of this and be glad to answer any questions that you have. It's a very responsive proposal, Mr. Gangor, from our previous review. Anybody have any other questions? Anybody have a motion? I move to accept the proposal. All right, motion been made. Is there a second? Second. All right, motion been made, properly second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion passes. Thank you so much. Excellent job. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I guess everybody's waiting on me. Um, our third case, uh, uh, if you'd like to come on up. Okay, this is gonna be a little bit different case. It's an appeal. Is this our appeal? Yeah, okay. Okay, so we, um, um, we're gonna follow the normal procedure. Uh, I'm gonna ask you gentlemen to push the microphone when you get ready to speak, turn it off when you get done for the record. Uh, we'll have staff introduce the case, but we're probably gonna go through some additional kind of orientation to try to figure out this new dynamic that we're dealing with, uh, an appeal of a prior decision. And uh, I, I've been on the board several years and I've never experienced this type of, uh, of appeal. So so if y'all will be patient with us, we'll, we'll sort it out, okay? All right, so Stonewater staff. I'm Tiffany Ibido, in case number 217 2620 Lebanon Pike. Um, map and parcel 095040249200. Inspector Donald Irves, applicant's request, appeal of denial of exemption. Request for an exemption from stormwater review pursuant to sections 3.5.2 and 7.1 of the Stormwater Management Manual. Appellant 2620 Associates LP, Representative R. Mark Donnell, Jr. For stormwater staff, our comments are staff recommends the site follows the Stormwater Management Manual and provide full water quality measures. Codes, no comment provided. Planning, defer greenways greenways defers to stormwater staff comments and council district is 15 for jeff syracuse 
Okay, so uh, if y'all would like to summarize your proposal for us, your appeal, and then we'll uh, we'll follow the, with the rest of the process. Sure, thank you all. And again, my name is Mark Donnell. I'm an attorney uh, representing uh, the owner of the property. Uh, this is Mr. Floyd Schechter, who's here with me, who's the principal of the ownership entity. Um, and this is, I do understand that this is different uh, for, for most of you all. Uh, and, and really, our, our argument here is that uh, this project is entitled to an exemption from stormwater review for purposes of uh, acquiring a building permit. Uh, and that the way that the staff um, has interpreted uh, the manual provisions that they pointed to is, is inconsistent um, and an incorrect interpretation of the manual. Um, and so th there's a part of this that is really legal argument, um, uh, sort of just looking at the document and, and figuring out what it says and uh, whether or not the way it's being interpreted is consistent with the intent of stormwater generally um, and, and the spirit sort of, of of why the manual is the way it is. Um, and so I was going to try to go through uh, just what we think are the relevant provisions um, briefly uh, and then have Mr. Schechter sort of talk about the practical implications on this particular development project uh, if, if the staff's recommendation is upheld. Um, I submitted uh, to Ms. Gilbert some materials in advance uh, that have uh, some of the relevant code and, and manual provisions. Did the committee members have those with them? Okay. Yes, um, we received them. Just because it might be easier to sort of glance at those as I'm going through uh, uh, some of the some of the details. So, um, the the place to start here, we believe, is with the code itself and um, short of short of the manual and, and the code itself creates an exemption for uh, small commercial or industrial developments. Uh, and there's just there's three simple measures there. Uh, if the project adds less than 10,000 square feet of impervious surface, which this project does add less than 10,000 square feet. In fact, all it adds is approximately 7,000 square feet pervious parking lot. Um, so so that's, that's satisfied. Does not alter a drainage channel and does not alter the natural ground elevation by more than five feet. So the three code elements of the exemption are satisfied and I, I staff can correct anything that I say that's incorrect but my understanding is there's no dispute about those um, and and so rightly or wrongly the stormwater manual adds additional elements for uh, a commercial or industrial exemption um, for a small project um, and and that's what uh, my, my client and his team looked at on the front end and planning this and in budgeting for it they looked at the particular provision of the stormwater manual that is titled Exemptions from MWS Building Permit Review. This is on page two of the, the summary sheet that I provided you. Um, and, and that section 3.5.2 is also very straightforward. Um, activities that require a building permit may be exempted from stormwater review if they are commercial or industrial development, which this is, again, add less than 10,000 square feet of impervious surface, which this does add less than 10,000 square feet and meet all of the criteria in 3.4.3, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, um, which is the separate exemption for excavation or fill. I won't go through those in detail, um, but uh, again, my understanding is that all 10 of the requirements for an exemption for excavation or fill in 3.4.3 have been satisfied. And so that was the starting point um, for my client for this project was we're going to look at 3.5.2 and then 3.4.3. We've checked all of those boxes. That should be the end of the inquiry. The response um, from stormwater staff was to point to a, another section of the manual altogether, which I've got um, copied and pasted on page three of the materials. Uh, and it comes from chapter seven, which by its very title uh, is different from building permit review exemption. It's titled post construction water quality policies and procedures. Um, and so first issue for us is this shouldn't even be part of this conversation about building permits. Um, but I've, I've bolded and highlighted um, in that provision the, the two sentences that Stormwater has pointed to um, to, to argue that th this project does not qualify for the exemption. Um, and it's those two sentences that begin with uh, projects that disturb greater than 10,000 square feet and are new developments, significant redevelopments, and or grading permit sites are therefore required to design, install, and maintain stormwater quality and quantity controls. So our focus, of course, is first of all, we don't think this applies. Even if it does, the and in that sentence is very important. Projects that disturb greater than 10,000 square feet, it, we don't, the project doesn't disturb greater than 10,000 square feet. 
that's the end of the inquiry. The rest of it doesn't matter because we don't meet the first of the two required elements of Section 7.1. Now, uh, Stormwater points us to uh, the, the next sentence, which is, in the case of a significant redevelopment, the entire footprint of the significantly re redeveloped structure shall count toward the total disturbed area. So the, the building that's on the screen there is, uh, the footprint is 7,500 square feet. So the bottom floor is 7,500 square feet. The top floor is 5,500, 6,000, 13,000 square feet or so total. But, but it's being redeveloped um, and money is spent to make improvements to the building, but it's not being disturbed. Nothing's they're not moving any dirt around uh, around that, that building. Um, and so really the, the only change to any of the surface area of the lot is the 7,000 square foot pervious parking lot that's going to go in the back. Um, but uh, if you take stormwater staff's interpretation of this, despite the fact that that's the case, you've got to add the 7,500 square foot footprint to the 7,000 square foot pervious parking lot. That, in their view, takes, takes you over the 10,000 square foot minimum for disturbed area. Now, um, anyway, so it's a little bit complicated. And I've only got one more legal point to make, and then I'll um, let Floyd talk about the, the practical implications. But um, we have stipulated that this project uh, will cost more than 50% of the current appraised value of the property, um, which Stormwater has said satisfies the significant redevelopment definition um, in the code. And so from their, their perspective, this would be a significant redevelopment. Um, however, uh, in looking closely at the definitions, which are at the bottom of page three here, um, the definition of redevelopment, so not significant redevelopment, just redevelopment, is development improvements that have a value of less than 50% of the current assessed value. So that would not be this project. But and or increases the floor area by less than 25%. And or means or in, in that scenario. This project does not increase the floor area by more than 25%. So <laughs> according to Stormwater's interpretation, this project is both a redevelopment and a significant redevelopment. However, those definitions make clear at the end. They both say, note, this is different than significant redevelopment. Note, this is different than redevelopment. So they're supposed to be mutually exclusive. But Stormwater's interpretation is, is not that. They would, they would argue that apparently it's, it's both of those things, which just throws more uh, mud in the water for all of this. Uh, and so I, I, drawing back, I'm focusing just on the legal interpretation issues. We think we satisfy the code. We satisfy 3.5.2. 7.1 shouldn't apply. Even if it does, we satisfy that because we don't disturb more than 10,000 square feet. And by the definitions, we're not a significant redevelopment. We're just a redevelopment because we're adding less than uh, we're increasing the floor area by less than 25%. Uh, with that, I'll uh, let Floyd talk about some more details of the project itself and some implications. So I know a couple, I, I know at least one member is familiar with the site, but for the commissioners that aren't, both Lebanon Pike and Old Lebanon Pike are elevated, and the grade of this property is significantly below the roads on either side. There's very little land. I actually resub. was on half an acre and 0.17 acres where the parking lot's going was bought separately a year later. Metro said, let's combine them, make it one subdivision. Well, the pervious parking lot that gets me any disturbance is on the separate parcel. But I resubdivided so that there's one tax parcel and one bill, which Metro encourages people to do. Okay. Um, if you look at where the stormwater's coming from on this site, the building roof is pitched from the south to the north, so from the Lebanon Road side toward the old Lebanon Road side. And the only scuppers are on the old Lebanon Road side or the north side, which we are treating the water. We're putting a pipe in the ground, inlets in the ground, and doing what we're required to do to run that water off the site. All the water we're talking about here, everything we're discussing, comes off the elevated, old, um, the elevated Lebanon Pike for a significant amount of distance from the top of the hill at J.B. Estill Drive to the bottom at Old Lebanon Pike and Lebanon Pike. Uh, and its sheet flows down the embankment that TDOT owns to a trough between the building and that embankment and runs sheet flow down grade off my site into an inlet that is up by the grassy area where Old Lebanon Pike is written on this diagram. 
on the north side, on the old Lebanon Pike side. So what I'm being asked to do is treat all the stormwater coming off a public road by this interpretation. I am not required to do so. And I've made that point, I've made it repeatedly. I understand the implications of what we're asking for in terms of other properties. This isn't about other properties, it's about this community and this is the heart of the Donaldson Communities Redevelopment District. I've been investing in Donaldson for 25 years. I haven't sold a property there in 25 years. I have been the only commercial developer in the Donaldson community that has done everything the community's asked for and I want to kick off the downtown Donaldson redevelopment with this project. That's the purpose and I applied for a building permit with fully engineered drawings in April, maybe April 1st and here we are. Um, the councilman's written you a letter saying he supports our application for an exemption. The board chair of HIP Donaldson, the largest community organization, has written you a letter that's in your file in support. The board chair lives in Bluefields, which is the subdivision directly across Lebanon Pike to the south. There's another community member here who's a member of the City Side Business Owners Association who's here, also lives in Bluefields. She'll testify. She's in support of the exemption we're requesting. Um, the only way that you can say we're not entitled to this exemption is to say that the word and is the same as the word or. If you believe that the ordinance, which all the authority for the manual comes from, isn't clear on its face, the ordinance is clear. Are you disturbing 10,000 feet? The answer is no, I'm not. There's no dispute factually to whether I'm disturbing 10,000 feet. End of story under the law. Then we get to the and or argument of the way it's being interpreted. Even the provision that is being relied on in the post-construction uh, element of the manual says and or is used for one of the three second conditions, the grading permit. It's not used for the first two. It says and redevelopment, new development, and significant redevelopment, and or grading permit. And means one thing, and or means another. We've made the arguments. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Would love for you to listen to the rest of the folk, to the uh, community member who's here to testify in support. He's got two minutes and we're done. I thank you for your time. Thank you for volunteering to serve on these boards. I know what a time constraint that can be. Thank you. Yes, would you, uh, would you state your full name again? Sorry, I missed My name that. is Floyd Schechter. Uh, company is Smart Space LLC and the entity that owns this property is 2620 Associates Limited Partnership and I am the managing general partner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schechter. We really appreciate you being here. That Thank added you. a lot to our understanding of your situation. So at this time, we'll ask for people who'd like to speak in support of this proposal. If you'd please uh, state your name and your address and turn on the mic right there. Somebody will for you. Thank you. Your address. Uh, Debbie uh, Sanford. I live at 239 Cumberland Circle in Bluefield Subdivision. I've lived there for 18 years and if you see Bluefield Avenue, you'll see how close our subdivision is to the property in question. I work at the Nashville Airport. I'm a member of both Hip Donaldson and Cityside. I know Floyd from the work he's put into Donaldson to try and make it as amazing as we know it should be. I have great trust in Floyd and Jeff Syracuse, our councilman, to do everything that is right for Donaldson. My neighborhood and myself are in full support of this exemption. For the past 18 years, I've had to look at the Johnson Furniture Building, which is what that building is, every single day. And basically, everyone in my neighborhood wants it to become something great. And the ideas that Floyd wants to do are perfect. He is the one person that is coming into our community to actually add the word hip to Hip Donaldson. So it's time that we start moving forward and actually have a chance to, to live up to what East Nashville is and everybody else. And, I am passionate about this and I am passionate about this building becoming something awesome. And they did paint a mural on it a few years back to try and help it. I guess it kind of did. Um, and I think it's staying, but I'm not sure. So as far as this exemption goes, I would love for, for it to pass and I would love for um, Floyd and his people to actually start making this building what it should be for Hip Donaldson. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.
Anybody else who'd like to speak in favor? All right. Anyone who'd like to speak uh, opposed to the proposal? All right. Seeing none, uh, you want to read into the record some of the uh, letters of support we receive? Hopefully they're short. The first one is from Council Councilman Jeff Syracuse, and he's stating that he is writing in support. This request is for an exemption of stormwater review at 2620 Lebanon Road. The staff has recommended that the appellant applicant treat the stormwater running across the property coming off Lebanon Road. This is not necessary for this case. Smart space has been an integral part of Donaldson community for over 25 years and has constantly set the bar for advanced reuse and quality redevelopment that has brought hundreds of jobs and improved the quality of life for everyone. And he states that he's unable to, to attend the meeting, but he does thank us in advance. And the other uh, that I received is from um, Maggie Zinglerter, and she's with Hip Donaldson. Um, and she states that she is the current president and board chairman of Hip Donaldson, and it's a nonprofit organization. And she has known Mr. Searcher? Sector. Uh, from his efforts on both personal and professional level to improve the quality of life in the community. His company has invested millions of dollars into the community over the last 25 years. The company owns and operates their properties for a long-term base. Floyd serves the board of Hip Donaldson and many other community organizations, and he provides both his time and treasure to many organizations in Donaldson. This request is for an exemption of stormwater review at 2620 Lebanon Road. The staff has recommended that the applicant treat the outset stormwater running across a small property before it enters the underground system at an inlet to the west of the property. This place, this place is an undue financial burden on someone trying to improve our community by preserving and repurposing a 67-year-old building in an iconic location. Okay, I've got a quick question and a comment, and then we'll open it up to members of the committee to ask questions. Mr. Donald, did, were you here when we read the statement at the beginning of our meeting about your rights and your client's rights? At, right at the very beginning? No, I wasn't okay. here. Would you mind rereading that statement for, for him? Okay, the statement is that you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee. You may appeal the decision by filing a writ of centuria from the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel and to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Thank you, ma'am. Just want to make sure you all understand. Um, okay, uh, uh, members of the committee, I'm ready. Any, any questions? <laughs> 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 okay, uh, this is unusual. I know that, you know, we have a zoning code, and um, when there are in, uh, interpretation uh, questions on the zoning code, I think Bill Herbert is the zoning administrator, and he makes those calls, but we're talking about a stormwater management now, so my question, I guess, to legal is: Do we is there an entity within Stormwater that's the legal interpreter of, of of the code? Like Bill Herbert would be for for the, for the zoning code. I don't know that there's a position like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so. I well, let me qualify. I mean, is it just a staff decision, like individual staff members, so or historically, yes, I think there has been a, a, a consistent staff interpretation of the, the manual regulations and the manual 
promulgation process is that staff authors it and then it has to be approved by the director of Metro Water Services and by the mayor in order to be adopted and filed with the Metropolitan Clerk. Um, and there is also a, a change management process that Rebecca can speak to much more intelligently than I can that um, uh, goes above and beyond those kind of minimal legal requirements for um, uh, changes to the stormwater management manual um, and kind of incorporates much um, feedback um, from the development community among others. Um, so um, the, um, I, it, this is very unusual as you all point out. Um, staff has generally had their interpretation of the manual um, and usually that doesn't usually no one disputes it, I guess. Um, uh, uh, in this case, I would, I, I mean, in general, I think Mr. Donald did absolutely ca correctly characterize um, applicable provisions. However, I would point out um, one change, um, uh, which is um, three point, he did correctly say that 3.5.2 is based on um, uh, the, the code provision of section 1564.130b. However, that section was amended um, by council in BL 2016.513. Um, and um, instead of the previous line that used to read, adds less than 10,000 square feet of impervious surface, that code provision now reads, disturbs less than 10,000 square feet. Um, so that is a little different. Um, and I would say that 3.5.2, where, where there's a discrepancy between the manual and the code, the code prevails. Um, the, kind of the net result of that, I think, is that when you're looking at two different provisions of the manual, you're looking at 3.5.2 and 7.1, those two provisions of the manual have equal dignity to each other. Um, if 3.5.2 had been based on a code provision that was contradictory to 7.1, then the code would prevail, but that code provision has been changed so there is no longer any such conflict. Um, I would assume that in a future iteration of the Stormwater Management Manual 352 will be conformed to 1564.130 as it's now been revised by the Metro Council. Um, so, so that's one kind of little additional piece of um, the, the legal context that I would give you all for your consideration. But, I mean, we, we debated um, whether this was even an appealable issue to some extent because as Mr. Donald again correctly characterizes, this is almost more of a legal argument than it is a, another kind of judgment call which you all are more accustomed to, to making. However, again, some of those same revisions in that same um, Metro Code revision that I mentioned that BL um, 2016 513 um, kind of um, set out kind of three different areas of appeal to y'all. Um, and it, a lot of the language is still in, was in the code previously, um, but it, um, it's kind of been reorganized so that the three things are kind of set forth as, as three separate things. And one is clearly variances, which y'all are very, very accustomed to doing. Um, the other is appeals of notices of violation, which y'all don't have very often, but have come before the committee at least once before that I recall, maybe twice in you know the 10 years or so that I've been here. It's uncommon, but it happens and it's always been a part of what your jurisdiction included. But now um, there's this language that was in there previously, but was maybe more associated with the variance provision and now seems to be almost kind of a standalone um, appeal, right? Which says more generally um, that if stormwater staff shall reject or refuse to approve a plan for non-compliance with this chapter or the regulations established in the stormwater management manual, 
the owner or authorized agent may appeal the decision of the director to the Stormwater Management Committee. So that's the route of appeal that we're here under today. So to try to simplify that, that was complicated. <laughs> uh, complicated answer to your simple so, question. So, so staff has rendered a decision that he doesn't comply with the stormwater manual. So my question is, has, has the director agreed with that decision? Has that gone to Scott Potter? Has he said, yes, I agree with staff? Because based upon what you just said, I think that we can't really make a decision on this until someone like Scott Potter probably renders the decision that they're not adhering to, or that his interpretation is uh, that they're not adhering to the to the regulations. And then my next question would be, I know on the Board of Zoning Appeals, I guess if the zoning administrator makes an interpretation and you disagree with it, then it's like an item A case, and, and, that, and the Board of Zoning Appeals has the ability to interpret it on their own. Do we have that ability? So, I mean, I think so. I mean, okay. um, I don't, I'm not familiar with an item A case. I don't staff the BZA, mm -hmm. um, so you may know more about it than I well, do. Well, just but a little bit. I think because you all have been given in the code the ability to review this kind of appeal, mm -hmm. um, that, that does give you the ability to essentially overrule the decision of the department. Okay. And so I'm just making sure that there has been a decision of the department. That, that, I'll, that question I'll defer to staff. Okay. Oh, so I'll try to explain how we got to where we are. And I'm going to do the best to say it as correctly as I can. <laughs> and uh, if, I, if I don't say it correctly, then right. somebody please chime in. I, I don't think we're worried about correctly. We're okay. worried about but I just, I I just want to, want to make sure <laughs> so. that there has been a decision made, and therefore now we can either agree with that decision or not. So this, I know you've had legal arguments, and I want to make sure you've exhausted all that. And if we're at the point that, that Metro Stormwater is saying, hey, this is our decision, and, and staff does a great job. Uh, so this is not a criticism of staff at all. This is probably just one of those little gray areas. Maybe there's an and or or that shouldn't be there that maybe needs to be changed in the future. I don't know. But as, as long as we are, we know as this body that a, a decision has been made and the proper authority has basically said that yes, we agree with staff, then I think we have the ability to deal with that. So the five second answer is the reviewer reviewed it and said Chief Fields water quality is required. Uh, the applicant disagreed. I, I looked at it, and I, the way I interpret the regs, it looked like it was required to. Okay. Uh, the applicant disagreed, so he uh, he went to the assistant director. And as I understand it, the, the assistant director did refer with legal for the wording, and the assistant director, who I think is not the director, but he has maybe the appointed authority, sure. rendered a decision after consulting with legal that he feels that the regulations does require the water quality. And uh, the applicant didn't agree, and that's why we're here. Okay, so I assume we have two things we can do, I guess. We can say we have a different interpretation of the uh, regulations, and we feel like that he's exempt. Or I assume that we can provide him a variance, or has he requested a variance to not have to provide stormwater quality? Um, we did recommend that they ask for a variance, but okay. they chose to do it this way instead. Okay. Okay, so I'm done, Don. Yeah, that's, that, that's fine. But uh, Mr. Chairman, but, so just to clarify, we, we did suggest that we have a, a variance process that says if you wish you don't want to do water quality, then you could ask for it because that's one of the appealable item, uh, okay. one of the items you could uh, apply for a variance. Okay. Um, so we, we, we suggested the variance. They decided to go the appeal, and as I understand it, uh, they are entitled to an appeal, and that's that's why we're here today as an appeal. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, unique in the American system that people have the right to hear from their peers in regard to questioning uh, public policy decisions. So, so, uh, but but maybe here's a more pertinent question, is is there any difference between a variance and appeal decision in this case? Can we essentially make the same kind of decision we would make in a variance in an appeal? Do you mean to say, can you grant a variance when one hasn't been asked for? <laughs> no, I, 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 well, I mean, if, if, if we grant their appeal, does it, isn't that in effect a variance? I, Arguably, I suppose that, um, well, I mean, you, no, in, in, in terms of strictly what they're asking for, they are asking you to interpret the management manual their way. So you, there wouldn't have to be a variance from the manual's provisions if their interpretation of it is the correct one. You would simply be saying this is what the manual actually does say. Okay, then. Uh, um 
Mr. Donald, if you disagree with that characterization, feel free to yeah, speak up. I'd like to hear, you know, because y'all are in legal arguments here, and I don't know, if, is there an attorney on this board? Because we don't have one right now. But we don't. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, he's, he's not okay. here. He's not right. here. Right. He's not understanding. Why don't you, why you need to chime in on this a little Mr. bit? No. Yeah, let's, let's hear from Mr. Donald and, and Mr. Schechter both, if they'd like. We're not going to make a decision without thoroughly getting your all's input. Uh, but uh, if, if you could stick to the aspects that our council just addressed, and, and then we'll respond. Sure. Um, and I know Mr. Schechter would like to uh, say some things as well. But one thing first, I would like to address the if it's inconsistent with the code, then the code governs um, the, you know, even if you say it disturbs less than rather than adds less than, um, that section of the code doesn't say anything about how much the project costs. I mean, the only way you get to disturbs more than 10 is by saying it costs more than 50% of the appraised value and therefore you get to include the existing footprint. Code doesn't say anything about that. So code adds more than, disturbs more than, it doesn't, doesn't matter when you look at this project and when you don't look at the dollar amount, which the code doesn't say anything about that, it satisfies the code. So. I'm sorry, I really just can't help myself. I apologize um, for making the legal response. Um, on the other question about, about um, uh, appeal versus variance, part of the practical consideration here is uh, Mr. Schechter's got financing in place. He's got a lease signed. We're on the clock in terms of trying to get this project done. Uh, by the time we even realized what was going on, if we would have requested a variance, we would have been in November instead of October. Part of it was to expedite the process so we could get a decision and and move on, but you know this is going to increase the cost of the project by 10 percent or so. So, so this is this is a big deal, and it might jeopardize the project. Probably will. But as to the more narrow question, um, I look at it in terms of <laughs> let's let's say that the committee says, all right, we're going to treat this as a variance uh, request, even though there hasn't been one, and we're going to say, you know, we're not talking about the code. It, you could do that, and and the only way that it's ever going to be challenged is if somebody challenges it. Um, I, I don't know if Stormwater would file a lawsuit with the Chancery Court to challenge your decision that you want to treat it as a variance or not. I'm pretty sure we wouldn't um, if that was the decision. And so I, I, I don't think you have to. I don't think you have to do that. Um, <laughs> I don't think you have to do that. I think you can you can treat it as an appeal and and make your decision about whether or not they've interpreted it correctly, um, since it is an adverse decision. I would just point out that I think if you decided amongst yourselves that you were going to treat it as a variance, um, the only way that gets messed with is if somebody files a lawsuit about it, and I'm pretty sure it's not going to be us. So uh, that's, I think that's it. I think Mr. Schechter had something to say. I have another add to the legal argument. Um, I just want to add one fact about variance versus appeal. The invitation to apply for a variance came along with an invitation from my engineer to do all the calculations about the stormwater coming off Le old Lebanon Road so that we could have a discussion about whether those stormwaters should be dealt with. To me, that's like um, inviting me to negotiate from a position of weakness. I don't believe it applies. That stuff, and I don't want to pay for it if I don't have to, and finally, it would have drug this out even further while the engineers had to go through those calculations. So the business decision was not that we didn't want to seek variance. It was we didn't want to do the engineering on the stormwater coming off Lebanon Road. That's all. Thank you. Can I provide a clarification? We do not require them to treat the off-site water. We only require them to treat the on-site water. If there's off-site water that enters the property, they're more than welcome to treat it or divert it. Okay, that, that, so was, just gonna a be, that was gonna be my next question. Yes, sir. Uh, so the issue is, is, is the, the size of the treatment measures is based upon the amount of water generated on-site. As long as I divert the off-site water. Okay. Okay. Now, what does that mean as long as they divert? Does that mean that it's at his expense to divert the on-site water? So if the water, if, if there is, not, and I don't remember, but if there is a pipe that comes onto their property, then they would either extend a pipe and bypass that water from their on-site water, so therefore they don't have to treat it. But that doesn't account for the sheet flow off the roads. If, if there if was a sheet the flow, they could uh, potentially design maybe a, a swale and capture it and then divert it again. At their cost. Okay, hang on, Mr. Schechter. Uh, would you turn your mic off, please? Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's okay to get upset. We just don't want to record it. So. <laughs> okay, so, uh, I, I, and that was my next question. There are the contours. So very clearly, uh, this site is receiving a significant amount of flow, at least from the south. 
right? The south and east. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm very familiar with the area. I'm, this is my former yeah. council district. Yeah. There's no infrastructure there. It's just a lot of overland yeah. flow. It's It'd be very difficult yeah. to yeah. separate any of that. Yeah. I understand the concerns, and yeah. this does sort of sit in a low area right there. So for, for clarification, the green uh, up on the screen is the infrastructure that's right there. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I know, and maybe Tiffany will correct me if I'm mistaken, um, I think there's a curb there. So I don't know necessarily whether all that roadside water is really entering to the property. Okay, then what, what, why, why, don't we, why don't we do this, then? why don't we do something like this then? I'm gonna make a proposal. Um, I, I, I'm personally concerned about the precedent of, of granting an appeal for a staff decision that has been vetted all the way up to the highest levels of the, of the agency and that council seems to agree is within their purview to do. Um, and, and I'm concerned about how it affects future behaviors, but um, there may be a condition that we could put on this without creating an improper precedent that would allow them to only at their own cost treat on-site water and not be responsible for meeting the regulation that requires them at their cost to treat off-site water. So can we grant a conditional, uh, it'd, be, it'd be a type of a variance to the requirement for treating off-site water in this unique case? I think that exists now, right? I mean, they, they wouldn't need a variance. I mean, that, yeah. uh, right now, if, if they, uh, that's all they're required to do. And so if they did that, then there's no, if they take care of everything. I just don't know that it's reasonable to design this manner in a manner to separate the stormwater. And well, I think that, that's I what think, I'm saying. I think that's their, that's their concern. Um, what if we don't hold them accountable for the offsite? You, yeah, I, yeah, I don't believe they still got diverted. The variance from their obligation to divert the offsite yes, water. Yes, that's what I'm saying. They are. They are. I, I don't. I, I just don't believe right now that they are treating any offsite water. I think the only thing they're treating, or the original proposal was only to treat onsite water. So if if um, if if we deny your appeal on the basis that you're not having to treat onsite water, would you be happy? If I'm not having to treat off-site water, the only reason I'm here is because the, I've filed plans that include treating the on-site water, but I have not received the exemption. And so I, either I'm exempt or I'm not, and the only way I'm not exempt is if you add the flow, because the way that, that the manuals being interpreted, it's to say that the footprint of that building gets me over disturbance of 10,000 feet. I don't disturb 10,000 feet. I'm treating everything on that site. The parking lot I'm putting in is pervious paving. I'm not, I mean, there's no way you could get to changing the plans I've filed unless you're adding water from somewhere else. <clears throat> well, I, so you've, you've requested that this committee look at um, the uh, interpretation, correct? Um, and so maybe that's really where, should, where we should focus. That's that's been the request, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, please, Miss Adams, just a question go ahead. for staff. So. It's your interpretation that, because as, I'm, as we're looking at the codes, and it's your interpretation that the disturbance, and when was that, that change, that, that wording ad was taken out and disturbance was added? Um, hang on, let me see. I have the bill here. <clears throat> it was adopted July 28, 2017. And yeah, is that July, oh. July 28th, 2017? Okay. Were you all, I, think, I guess you all weren't aware of? No. Uh, after we filed. When, did, when, when was it made available to, to um, the Yeah, public? so that would have been right after the, the, the plans were submitted and the request for the exemption was made. So, so that's I, my concern. It's a legal question. I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not sure it matters. 
uh, uh, disturbs versus adds less than, but I, I, I'm, if it was until July, then I don't think it would apply to this project. I mean, I think that the <clears throat> committee applies the current law. Okay, so so what what are the implications if we grant the appeal and exempt them? Uh, are we going to see a flood of other applicants that are going to make it difficult to uh, to follow to go forward with consistent prior practice of it interpreting the regulations this way? I mean, I don't know. I think that in revising the stormwater management manual, the appeal provisions may be narrowed to the more traditionally understood avenues of appeal in future, but that is speculative on my part. So what is the specific request to be, to be, ex uh, what is the specific request? Okay, so one thing I'd like to clarify, we file our building plans before the effective date of that change. I understand that. So to answer your question, you do not have to rule today that we're, that by granting our appeal, it violates the current state of the law. And the flood of other applicants does not necessarily ensue because we filed and we are being dealt with under the old law. You, once you've filed, It'd be like a zoning change. If you've already filed for your zone change and then the law changes about zoning, you're under the old statute. You're not, you can't retroactively change the law on an applicant. Let me ask the, the attorney. Are we are applying. Let me, let me talk to the attorney for yeah. just a second. So if we agree with you that uh, the provisions of the stormwater regulations don't apply to you, does that mean that you are exempt from a grading permit? Is that, is that the end net result? Is that, that, Steve, is that what we're, So we're exempt from a grading permit anyway. What, what, we're, we're exempt from stormwater review for purposes of okay. obtaining a building permit. All right. That, so that, that's the request. That, okay. The formal request we're making is to overrule staff's decision that this project does not qualify for the exemption from stormwater review as part of the building permit process. Okay. So I'm going to make a motion that um, I agree with the applicant. And uh, that's just sort of get the ball rolling procedurally. Uh, so I'm making a motion that uh, we agree with the applicant on his interpretation that you are exempt from the provisions of a, of a of stormwater review. Is that correct? So that's my motion. And I second that. Okay, we have a motion uh, and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion or questions on the motion? I just have one question. And maybe it was already said, but why is the square footage of the building being added into this equation? So in the second part of 7.1, they say in the for significant, for significant redevelopment, the entire footprint of the building will be deemed disturbed if the building is significantly redeveloped which the significant redevelopment definition comes in for improvements of over 50%, which we believe that the improvements are over 50%. So the staff interpretation was that the building footprint, based on that definition and the wording in there, is included within the disturbed area. So with the building of six, 7,000 square feet plus an additional, you know, five, 6,000 square feet of on-site grading, that was over the 10,000 threshold. So you're adding the grading into, so it help into the building, into the square footage, I just want to make sure I'm. Yes, ma'am, let me see, that's, um, I, I think they read it in 7.1. Let me see if I can't find it real quick. It's anything about and or grading permit. It says, um, in the case of significant redevelopment, the entire footprint of the significantly redeveloped structure shall count towards the total disturbed area. And I'm sorry, one more thing that I've failed to mention. We got a, a late filed letter from an engineer in support of our request that I emailed, but I'm not sure it was received. And it's from, um, it's from Jim Lukens, Lukens Engineering. I just I basically want to make sure it's part of the record. Okay. If, if you just like to bring it forward and hand it to our technical secretary. Okay. Hang on a minute, Mr. Dale. Um, okay. So, um, um, I, I, I'm still not sure that resolves the central issue because 
Uh, is no. my, my impression Mr. Schechter's main concern was the offside stormwater. That's his main concern. Okay. So yeah. the rest of this is just interpretations of regulations. That's true. So, so it's, it seems to me if we could deal with the central issue of the on-site, off-site stormwater, that would solve the problem. Well, I think if we grant this, uh, yeah. it solves it. He doesn't have well, to deal it, with it. Well, but not necessarily because it, it does create a precedent for an exemption that we got to deal with. Maybe not. Somebody that's, that's my next, that was the next question I was going to ask. This n new regulation that was added or new yeah, this, the, the, if that was in effect at the time you made your application, would it affect you? The disturbance versus adds less than? Mm -hmm. Our position is that it wouldn't. Even, even with the new? Well, it, <laughs> so the answer is it depends. I mean, I understand uh, uh, Metro Legal's position mm -hmm. is that because 7.1 talks about disturbance, that now somehow connects it to disturbance. But uh, it, our, our position is that in, in this case, you don't need to add the square footage of the existing footprint regardless. Whether I'm trying to help you. I think. Yeah, no, I, I understand. If, if there was something but, that but would, I, I at the time of your application was not a part of a, a regulation, yeah. then I think we could say, hey, we I, interpret, I, I, we yeah. agree with you, and it makes you different in that the reason we're agreeing with you is because there's, yeah. that at the time you applied, something was in effect. And therefore, so, we're not opening the door for yeah. all people in the future, yeah. and that would be my... Uh, yeah, and my only caveat would be I'm, I'm not acquiescing to that interpretation, mm -hmm. but but I do agree that, that based on the way it's being interpreted, that absolutely affected us in a way that was unanticipated because at the time we submitted the application, it was, I mean, under that under that interpretation, yes, it definitely makes a difference. And, and I could think, I would say that maybe this committee could certainly say that, and that could be a, a reason or a rationale behind why we would grant your request is that now there's something different. It didn't. It was in effect when you applied. Therefore, we feel like you should be exempt, and anybody in the future would be would would have a different scenario. And if they disagreed, then they come right back to us again, and then we would take them to make an interpretation again. And so, I don't yeah. think this is going to open the door. I don't think it's going to set a precedent. And 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 so um, yeah. that would be. I'm going to hear from an attorney. Yeah, let's yeah, let's hear from our counsel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could I make one little nitpicky clarification of the law as well? Because I can't help myself either. Um, I, I think what Mr. Schechter was earlier referring to, and I don't mean to put words in his mouth, was the Vested Property Rights Act, which is a state law. Um, we did examine whether that would apply to this situation. Um, I consulted with attorneys within my office who, who do the zoning and planning and deal with that more often than I do. And the three triggers for that are the filing or the approval of a preliminary development plan, a final development plan, or a building permit. We don't believe that any of those three triggers have occurred yet in this this particular factual scenario, and so we do not think that that act would apply. Okay, but that that doesn't answer Mr. Dale's question. I, I, it doesn't. I'm, I apologize. Okay. But, I mean, I mean, I th I think the answer is that if the 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 way that the code now talks about the appeal processes is. Um, confusing, then that needs to be amended. And we need to clarify that the more traditional routes of appeal that this committee has always heard are the variances and the appeals from the NOVs, and that we would have to go back to council essentially and get them to maybe clarify that in the code and that that would be the way to stop um, additional situations like this from coming before you. Um, I don't know if that does answer your question, but whether other applicants will look at this case and like come forward and bring similar types of appeals as this one is, I just can't answer that. That's speculative. But I think the way we can fix that is by trying to do it legislatively. And I can't help myself either. We, none of us can today. <clears throat> and, and, and I probably, maybe a convolute the whole situation to talk about this because I think we're talking about a legal interpretation. But outside of that legal interpretation, which I think is what we need to base this on, there's also a, a community aspect here. Having lived in Donaldson for a long time, having been a council member here, all of Nashville seems to be redeveloping. For whatever reason, Donaldson is having a very difficult time. 
And I think that's why you have someone here from the community. You have a letter from Hip Donaldson. This is a central piece of property in the middle of Donaldson that if this property is redeveloped, that I think it provides a great benefit to the community. Now, maybe that doesn't come into play when we make this interpretation of, of legalities, but I think it should be something that some of the board members here are concerned about because there are representatives here from a community perspective, as well as a legal perspective, as well as an engineering perspective, and an environmental perspective. So um, I'm just going to reno renew my motion uh, to approve this, uh, your request that uh, your interpretation is correct. Okay. And Mr. Dale, so could you give your reasoning behind that yeah. motion? What? Uh, um, most specifically, that I, I believe that they made application uh, prior to uh, a, a revision of the requirements, which could have affected them. I felt like that that um, this is will not be a precedent, and that there are there's other uh, considerations out there that would be that would be looked at in interpretation of the laws. And if any event they someone else was to come back with a similar request they'd come right back to this committee and, and therefore we would have to render a decision. And our decision probably would be different based upon uh, things that exist today that didn't exist the time they made application. Okay, so let me see if I can ask a couple other questions because uh, I, I do think it's an important decision when you exempt someone from the regulations. And I, I think all of Mr. Dale's comments are valid from a uh, personal community perspective. Um, and I'm most concerned about Mr. Schechter's um, responsibility for off-site water. I mean, that, that, that these are state highways, they're generating that runoff, and there are other properties that are generating that runoff, and, and, you're, and, and your lot is below grade, and there should be a recourse for that kind of extra burden. It's unfair. Okay, so th that's the issue. That's the issue right there. That's the primary issue that's brought up this technical process to try to be relieved of that unfair burden. So, so let me ask this question, see if this helps. Uh, are you all going to go forward with the previous paving regardless? Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, secondly, are there any water quality features that would have been required of them for on-site water that they would not go forward with as a result of, ex of this exemption? Um, I just remember when they originally submitted, the plan had water quality on it. You and mean like a mechanical treatment system for water quality? No, they had bioretention ponds okay. actually on there. Okay. Um, and then I think pavers as well. And from the second submittal, they changed it a little bit and put urban bioretention in. Okay. And then after that, the third submittal, we got it back to say, hey, we don't want to do water quality. We're exempt because of this. Okay. And so that's our issue, I guess. My issue, for one, is we went through three months back and forth, and when they changed the plan, they didn't want to do water quality to take on, okay, we're only – dealing with the parking lot and so it's under 10,000 this is what it is and so, so that's how we got here okay. right. so it's not that right. it's they can't do it i mm -hmm. think it's just a saving money issue maybe uh, as far as the water quality from my opinion and then two uh, when you do the boundary as uh, steve said you usually do the bypass of off-site water so that from my memory, wasn't really an issue. It was just treating the on-site water. The off-site water wasn't really an issue as far as I could remember from the first two submittals that were sent with the water quality on the plans. But, but, but that, that type of undefined risk is pretty critical to an investor and, and to someone bearing the risk of, of that open legal responsibility. So I'm, I'm inclined to figure out a way to remove that responsibility because it's unfair um, without destroying the, the internal due process of the way staff typically interpret these things. So, uh, so if, if they were to abide only by on-site water quality expectations, would they have to do more than porous paving? Yes, they will. Okay. Okay. Uh, just for clarification, once more time, 
we're not asking them to treat the off-site water, just, I, just the on-site water. I, I know, but you're also not guaranteeing that they won't have to. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, sir. Yeah. No, you can't. Just, and that's a risk. That, we're just asking that the is, outside. Yeah, that is a risk, and 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 nobody should be burdened with a, with an undefined risk that that can be defined, and and I think we have that authority if we if we choose it. So, we, uh, from a parliamentary procedure standpoint, we have a motion on the table. It's been properly seconded. We have to act on it in due time. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna I, th I think we understand the issue. Uh, my perspective is, with all due respect to Mr. Dale, I, th I think this, that may be the wrong way to go about this. So that's just my individual opinion. I, th I think if the motion were not supported, that we could come back and, and give him a clear expectation of not having to deal with off-site water from a water quality perspective, but also having to deal with his on-site water quality, which he would be exempted from if we pass this motion. But that is the, the final decision is the, is represented by the majority of the committee. So I think so enough has been said for us to vote. Not, not Mr. necessarily. To, I, I think unless Mr. Dale wants to add I something. I do want to add something. Appropriate. So, so to, to assume that the off-site can be separated from the on-site, that's a pretty strong assumption. I, I, and, and what would it take to do that? So that's, let's just throw that out there. No, I, 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 think, I think you're, I think you're, you're um, missing my point. Mm -hmm. I would exempt them completely from even having to be worried about off-site. Well, but the, if the water's coming across their site from off-site, then it's not going to I don't know what they do to design to treat their stormwater because it's intermingled. So I don't know. Uh, but the reason we're here, I think, is because we're, there's a 7,000 square foot, there's a building that's being rebuilt and, it's, and that's being considered to be disturbance. That is a stretch in my imagination. You're, are you changing the building? Are, are the, the facade, I mean the, the roof of the building? Are you working interior to the building? You're tearing the building down? Strictly interior, we re-roof, but no, okay. no disturbance inside the footings. So there's no land disturbance as a result of the, of the working on the building itself? At the right rear corner in that diagram, we're adding an elevator, okay. and we added treatment for the disturbance okay. of the elevator. Pit. So if the building is not considered to be disturbed area, then you are exempt from the stormwater requirements? That is correct. I, I just, I, I, I think that's a wrong interpretation and I, I call for the question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I, before you go for a vote, excuse, excuse me, yes. we've had a call for the question. That, that's a parliamentary procedure process that I have to honor and uh, I think we're ready for a vote. So, is that correct? Madam Council, uh, am I interpreting that correctly? Do we vote okay. to call for the question? We got to vote. All right. So all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Which motion are we voting on to call for the question or the motion? Yes, that's, oh, that's the, the confusing the, Are we uh, voting on whether we're, to call? We're, or are, we voting, are we voting on the main motion? The, the call for the question is a request to vote. And, and are we voting on the main motion? We are voting on the main motion. So your previous vote was on the call for the question, and Correct. now you were voting on the main motion. Now we're voting on the main motion. Uh, okay. I, I didn't think a call for the question had to be voted on. Okay. So why don't why don't we back up and clarify? Again. Let's just do it one more time. So, okay. so I think we, as my so saying, I called for the you're, question. You're asking for the discussion to cease by motion. Is there a second for that motion? All right, Ms. Ronette Adams seconds the motion. Motion been made, properly seconded. Is there any discussion on the call for the question motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of stopping discussion and voting say aye. 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 All those in favor, all those against that motion say nay. Nay. It has to be two okay. thirds. I think. Motion, motion passed with a, with a two thirds majority. Okay, so now we're on the present motion, okay. All those in favor of the motion to exempt, as proposed, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. 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 Motion passes four to two. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you all very much.
Okay, so uh, I believe that takes care of uh, all of our three cases. Now we have, uh, do we have any business, Madam Secretary? We have no new business. Uh, will someone want to entertain a motion to uh, adjourn? I move we adjourn. Okay, motion's been made to adjourn. Do we have a second? A second. Motion's been made, properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All right, all those opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. We are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.